Gary, thank you so much for making time and it's a pleasure to meet you here in New York. Now, to introduce your next lecture that you will give on the 21st of March, I have some questions. You chose the topic, Timeless Values in a Shifting World. Why this topic? I think this topic is important at any time because we are talking about timeless values. But uh, the issue of values becomes even more important uh, at a time when uh, uh, the human race is at the nexus, uh, where you have to choose the path for the future. And um, if you miss it, if you make a wrong turn, you know, the, the, the cost for rectifying this mistake could be too high. And um, I think that after the end of the Cold War, uh, the victory made uh, the free world complacent. And uh, um, nearly 25 years have been wasted without having, you know, um, proper comprehensive discussions about the future. The future built on our values, the values that made the free world successful, the values that helped the free world to win the Cold War. Yeah. And uh, pretending that these values can change with the changing world, it's doing a great disservice uh, for the core, core foundation of our civilization. So I want to talk about uh, geopolitical picture, but always refer to the values that made the success of free world possible. What is it that drives you? Where is your political commitment coming from? Uh, I always believe that my duty as a duty of any decent human being is to contribute time, energy, and resources to make a difference. And I felt that I could make the difference first in chess, and now I think I could make, though maybe not as huge contributions in the game of chess, but still significant contribution uh, for this world to understand the nature of the challenges we're facing and rational ways of dealing with these problems and uh, looking into the future, because somehow it, uh, uh, it correlates with what I did at the chess. At, at at, at the chess board, by analyzing the games, looking for mistakes, and preparing for future battles. Yeah. In 1972, Alexander Solzhenitsyn uh, had his Nobel speech, and I would like to quote him. Um, he says, The spirit of Munich is in no sense, no sense a thing of the past, for that was no flesh in the pen. I would go so far as to say that the spirit of Munich is the dominant one in the 20th century. The spirit of Munich is an illness of the willpower of the well-to-do. It is the usual state of those who have surrendered to the lust for comfort at any price. They have surrendered to materialism as the main aim of our life on earth. End of quote. I think you agree with this, right? Absolutely. Um, the situation in 1972 was different. Um, but these words can, can be easily applied to the current situation uh, in the form of Soviet Union and actually to other challenges that the free world is facing. Yes, you agree with him, right? So then the question is, how come, he says this in 1972, you say equal things nowadays, how come that in the 20th century and the 21st century, the West is still under the spell of the spirit of Munich? Yeah, let's, let's be very clear, this is not a linear progression. Yes, there was a Munich. Yes, there was Chamberlain, who followed by Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, there was a Yalta conference where, you know, under pressure from Stalin, so uh, Churchill and, and Roosevelt, mainly Roosevelt, agreed to sort of give up part of Europe because it was probably um, very hard to resist the pressure from the dominant Soviet army in the, in the continent. But then that was Harry Truman, who defended the free world, who saved Western Europe, who saved Taiwan, who saved uh, South Korea. Um, and it was always, you know, like in, it's black and white. I'm not saying black and white. It's just, you know, it's the, the different periods. 1972 was not a good period. Um, it was a period when the free world was on retreat. But eight years later, Ronald Reagan, and it was the counterattack that ended up with a triumphant victory. Uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and eventually fall of communism and uh, and collapse of the Soviet Union. 
naturally after big victory, complacency, joy, let's celebrate. And we forgot that the disappearance of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union did not mean the end of our fight against evil. Evil survives. Evil could change its forms. But the challenges are always there. Uh, history cannot end as uh, was predicted by Francis Fukuyama. There's no end of history. History is seasonal. That's why I'm coming out with a book, Winter's, Winter is Coming, because it's seasonal. It's, it, it, it repeats itself uh, as Munich uh, uh, in 1938 was somehow repeated in, in early 70s, reflected by Solzhenitsyn, reflected now. But I have no doubt that the strengths of our civilization that helped us to to reach the position where we are now. And when the first time in, in the history of human race, democracies, the free world, uh, um, is much more powerful than all the enemies combined. There is the total domination militarily, politically, financially. Uh, but it also creates a psychological challenge because people who are so comfortable with their lives, they have no appetite. They have no stomach to go for wars and conflicts and uh, they, they tend to resist any calls to their duties. Mm -hmm. But again, at one point they recognize that the challenge is imminent and uh, uh, it doesn't go away and uh, the combination of factors will uh, mobilize the free world once and again to defeat its enemies. But do you already see new Trumans or Reagans or people standing up? No, I don't see new Trumans or Reagans in this country, neither in Europe, but I believe there is a huge potential that will be revealed very quickly because the cycle of replacing politicians today is much quicker. You have um, so many means of communication that could, you know, build and ruin reputations and information travels fast. So the moment the public realizes the public in the, United, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, uh, in Holland, uh, the moment public believes that um, the free world must present a very strong, uh, uh, sufficient response to the threats coming from Putin, from Al-Qaeda, from ISIS, from all sorts of thugs who are threatening uh, uh, the, 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 uh, to destroy the values of our civilization, uh, I'm sure democracy always provides um, uh, its paladins. There will be warriors that will be called by the public, but, and I think it will take almost no time. Will your lecture be a call to the to the public to take up arms and fight? My lecture will be um, an attempt to explain why this threat that we're facing today is existential. Uh, and we don't have to waste time, as we did in the 30s or in the 60s or 70s, to wait for the um, uh, day of doom, so to, to wait for this threat to become real existential. You don't have to prove it to everybody, you know, uh, who has no interest in politics. You don't want, you know, German bombs dropped to London. So as you don't want, you know, uh, Soviet Soviet troops in Afghanistan and... and uh, uh, the world at, 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 at the edge of apocaly nuclear apocalypse. You'd better deal with the problem uh, when the, 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 the cost of, of solving this problem is still not extremely high. And, uh, and I will be communicating the, this message to people in the audience and, and way beyond this audience that this is not a simple response to a military threat uh, or, you know, political maneuver to sort of outsmart Putin's of this world. This is a very important moment for us to lay down the vision for the future. The future that will be built upon the values that made us successful. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, you know this famous quote uh, of uh, this French conservative philosopher Joseph de Maitre. He said, he must have said, uh, every nation gets the government, the leaders it deserves. Now, the Russians, with its gigantic cultural heritage, the Tolstoys, the, the dan all the dancers, um, the musicians, 
the poets, Ahmad of Gary Kasparov. Science, science too, look, you know, we have science, right. we have space race, space race. Uh, agree. So does Russia deserve Putin? Okay, what about German heritage? You know, right. philosophy, science, uh, uh, music, I mean, you name it. And then Hitler, burning books. It seems to me that um, almost every nation, so many nations, goes through the period of madness. And what we are facing today in Russia is the ultimate power of this propaganda machine that could turn millions of people into zombies, even despite uh, alternative sources of information available. Uh, it's hard to resist such pressure with 24-7 propaganda machine that has been working uh, on the Orwell's uh, um, uh, principles. The war is peace, the slavery is freedom. It's a complete lie. And uh, many people simply couldn't believe that such lie can become sort of a, a permanent uh, uh, guest or just it's um, not even a guest, you know, it's, it totally occupied Russian media space. Um, uh, I think it's, it's temporary. I think it just, it will go away. This, again, it happened before history. It will happen this time in Russia. The problem is not what will happen with Putin. He will end up as a rat in a bunker. That's no doubt about it. That's the, that's what happens with guys like him. The problem is what price Russia, Ukraine, former Soviet Union, and the entire world will pay for Putin's madness. Because unlike Hitler, he has his finger on the nuclear button. And uh, uh, that's why I'm calling for decisive actions today, as I called yesterday, or day before yesterday. Because from history, I know, I, I, I know that one simple thing, the lesson that we can learn. Even if the, 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 the price of confronting dictator today, a dangerous dictator, might look high. And if the, even the consequences may be very uh, potentially dangerous, tomorrow the price goes up. And the day after tomorrow the price will go even higher. So sooner we confront this dictator, and to confront him today, we must recognize it's inevitable, because his algorithm of staying in power includes conflict within Russia, outside of Russia, and in, 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 in neighboring countries, and also with the rest of the world, because that's the only way to prove his uniqueness and invincibility for Russian public, to keep up millions, tens of millions of people in this zombie status, you have to sort of raise the stakes all the time. You have to keep bluffing with a very weak hand in poker, but keep bluffing, uh, threatening even with nuclear arm 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 Armageddon uh, to scare off your uh, opponents. So we have no choice. And again, this is not a simple, you know, fight between us and them. This is a fight between civilization that is responsible for most of great things happening on this planet. And we must protect it and we must do it uh, uh, remembering about these great timeless values that uh, you know, uh, made the success of this civilization possible. My final question. Your lecture is very political, philosophical also. Now, these are not particularly things young students nowadays are very much interested in. Why would you urge especially young students to come to the lecture? I think I will tell them a few interesting things. So it just, it's, um, I was always curious to hear people uh, that have something to say. Uh, I uh, think that I can present in a concentrated form the very important ideas for them to think of. Uh, I'm not sort of laying down my vision for the future, or telling them this is the only road that they have to choose. But I want people to think, I want them to become active again. I think it's very important to revitalize democracy by bringing people in. Democracy is not for people in 
Washington, Berlin, Paris, Hague, London. Democracy is for everybody to be active. And uh, we have unique opportunities now with all these communications um, uh, techniques, with new technologies, to get our message straight to the, to, 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 to the desks of those who are making decisions. And uh, I will be again uh, also addressing the audience, especially young audience, asking them to become active. Not to wait before crisis comes to you. Think, use the technology, use the experience that, that could be accumulated from reading the books and also again collecting this data from internet. Predict this crisis, see the problem before it becomes too, uh, too, too big and address it. Again, democracy is a, is, 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 is a very vibrant thing. It's just, it's, it's, it survives and it flourishes when people are actively engaged. It's about using the power and the wisdom of the crowd. And that will be one, one, of the, my, one of my messages because it's also part of the timeless values. Gary, thank you so much for this interview. And all of us are very much looking forward to your lecture on 21st of March. See you very soon.